All right, and we are back with yet another installment of Japanese literature and culture before 1600. Um, literally just moments before I hit record on this video, I just got done talking about sort of um, warrior culture in medieval Japan and how it's very different from perhaps what your preconceptions may be. If you never had those preconceptions, that's awesome. But now we're going to turn to a particular text. We're going to be talking about the, let's see if I can share this. We're going to be talking about this text right here, the Taiheiki. And I included the, for those of you who are, um, who can at least read Chinese because those would not read very differently in Chinese, um, the Chinese characters for Taiheiki, um, <laughs> the, the title of which literally means um, chron a chronicle of the great peace. So you have the, the chronicle of great peace. This is a text that was written in the late 14th century, and it deals primarily with that period that I talked about in the in my previous video, in which um, Ashikaga Takauji and his dudes um, initially betray the Hojo clan, and then betray the emperor, and then ultimately establish their own center of power in Kyoto. Now, the, the title of this text is a little perplexing. Um, you could take it ironically. In fact, I'm one of the people who does take it ironically because the entire period that's being described in this text is a period of essentially constant warfare. And it, and it is a gunki monogatari. It is a sort of, it's a warrior, it's considered to be a warrior tale, even though technically it's a key. It's not a, it's not a monogatari, it's a key. It's a record, it's a chronicle. So it is a historical record, so to speak, but it has a lot of, it, it exaggerates a lot at times. There, there are times when the text will say something like, you know, 20,000 warriors rode up out against 30,000 warriors in one location. And like, that's just not possible. Armies of this period were just not this big. And we know this because, for example, there are Chinese sources, sources, sorry, I should say in Chinese, that deal with the, the Mongol invasion of Japan and their account of how large the various forces were is, let's just say, drastically different from what Japanese estimates of you know military forces tend to be. So it's hard to know exactly how big these armies were, in fact. But it seems kind of unlikely, especially given with the size, given the size of armies that existed um, just prior to the Edo period during the the Sengoku Jidai, that they were like you know twenty and thirty thousand, you know, in a single army. That seems. It actually seems a little far-fetched. And so because of that like tendency to exaggerate, some people actually think that the, the title is, is a bit ironic. That it's like, oh, that's the, the period of the great peace. I huh, get it. Um, however, now this is not um, a consensus view. It's, it's actually a point of argumentation. There are some people who believe that they're actually, you can take this straight because the straight interpretation emphasizes how um, Ashikaga Takauji actually brought stability from a time when things were kind of falling apart. And in many ways, sort of this is then, it's a different take on sort of the problem of the, the Tales of the Heike. Whereas in the case of the Tales of the Heike, it was sort of like, I mean, that text is extremely depressing because it's just like, you know, everything's going to fall apart at all. Just like we, we can't do anything. The world is coming undone. This text, we kind of see something different. We see a kind of val a slight valorization of Takauji, especially in the way in which he sort of like takes an untenable situation and actually finds some sort of like stability and peace out of it. So ultimately, you can take it either way. It's not it's not clear cut. Um, another thing I want to talk about, which I guess I probably more properly should have been in my previous video, although since it's relevant to the Taiheiki more explicitly. In fact, we'll see an example of a battle later on. Um, again, when talking about medieval Japanese warfare, it's important to remember that this is very different from your preconception. Like if you've seen a lot of Kurosawa movies or like, you know, if you've watched a lot of anime, 
you probably have this idea of like you know samurai walking around with their you know a single sword and you know, not wearing any arm like completely unarmored and then they fight duels in the country like out you know amongst like the the pompous grass that's i mean that's kind of sort of happened in the Edo period but that's definitely not indicative of what's going on at this time a typical japanese battle in medieval japan really had three stages so stage number one so you would have an exchange so there would be like a skirmishing so if you imagine like you know you've you got two battle lines you know they're separated from each other so you know there were there were actual foot soldiers in this period who would carry halberds and like long spears and things like that but sort of out in front of these lines you would have guys on horses and they would be kind of like you know skirmishing with each other riding back and forth and so you should recall that these are primarily in the warriors in this period are primarily horse archers in fact they were very similar to the um the mongolian warriors that actually took over <laughs> china and created the yuan dynasty <clears throat> there are a lot of commonalities between the mongolian horse archers of the the sort of east asian steppe and the japanese um, warriors of this period so they would exchange some arrow fire from horseback and then once that kind of died down you would have this sort of period where okay so again you know you have the the, the two lines and oops, sorry bump that you'd have the two lines and then you know someone would ride out from one of those lines and sort of like present himself before the enemy forces and be like you know i'm this dude i'm the son of this guy and my family all ate cheese but you know okay but, you know you would give his genealogy why he's super cool and important and in an attempt to make him name for himself he's like is there any among you who will come and fight me in single combat and then generally someone would actually come out and meet this this guy in single combat and then they would fight um either on horseback or on foot probably on horse more, more commonly on horseback at least <clears throat> of the warrior tales that i've read and, and sort of the descriptions of these sorts of battle scenes they usually fight on horseback primarily um and then once the sort of the, the duels take place a sort of general melee will often break out involving sort of the the foot soldiers and warrior monks and whoever else happens to be present at the battle at that time but i'm thinking about the 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 the, the text of the taiheiki itself um there's really sort of three bits of it that i want to focus on so one is sort of a longer section that deals with takuji's first betrayal <clears throat> So when I say betrayal here, I'm not talking about his betrayal of the emperor. I'm talking about his betrayal of the Hojo. So this is the, the period when he decides to go against the Hojo clan and sort of take the side of the emperor to, to fight against them. And there are a lot of important, like, there, there are a lot of weird things, at least if you have this preconception of, like, you know, duty and honor and, like, betrayal being this, like, ultimate evil there are a lot of weird things about this text because actually Takuji's betrayal is framed in a really peculiar way. So if you look at page 238, so this is page 238 up here. Um, near, it's the sort of next to last paragraph of this page. So um, this guy in Nagasaki Enki, he goes to talk to um, this monk named Sagami, and he says to him, can it be true that Lord Ashikaga takes his wife and young lords to the capital, he said. This is a most suspicious thing. So now the reason why this is, is suspicious is because they're in Kamakura, and they're talking about from the perspective of the, the Kamakura government. So like, you know, that, so this would mean Ashikaga taking his family away from Kamakura, in essence, to protect them because he's going to betray them. This is a most suspicious thing. At such a time as the present, we must watch even those bound to your family by close ties. And these close ties that he's referring to is the fact that um, uh, Takuji's wife was a member of the Hojo clan. Uh, moreover, Lord Ashikaga is a noble of the Genji. I'll get back to this in a second. Who may perhaps nourish a plan in his breast for many years have elapsed since the Minamoto became without influence in the realm. So what Takauji is about to, the text frames what Takauji is about to do is in many ways an attempt to restore the prominence of the Minamoto clan. In other words, the betrayal of the Hojo is strangely 
not actually a betrayal of his duty to his kin and to his family or to you know the cause more broadly understood precisely because the Kamakura Shogunate itself was originally a creation of the, the Minamoto. And so by like trying to bring the, the Minamoto back to power because the Ashikaga are, as I noted in my previous video, related to them, this is an attempt to sort of in many ways relitigate these old clan rivalries. And we'll see another example of this later on. <clears throat> So to go back to my outline, um, yeah, so it notes that what's interesting is that because of the fact that, so is this 241? No, 241's down here. Okay. Um, they don't, they believe that because of the, so the the people who were there at the, the court in Kamakura, <clears throat> believe that because of these established relations that um, Takauji has with the, the Hojo clan through his wife, and also because of the fact that he's like, that they could never possibly um, betray him. Um, the text takes a somewhat more interesting approach to this because it, so it notes here, this is, so this is near the bottom of page 241. It's the, it's the next to last paragraph. It's, it's starting right here with yet for many generations. Yet for many generations, the house of of Ashikaga had found favor in the sight of the Hojo and received kindnesses from their hands. I'll get, come back to this in a second. So that there was none in the realm to match its prospering. Likewise, Takauji had taken a wife, had taken to wife a kinswoman of Akahashi, the former governor of Sagami, who had borne him many young lords. Not without reason, did the Sagami lay monk believe in him, thinking, by no means will this man be faithless. So from the, the Hojo perspective, they believe, so Again, this goes back to something that I said in the previous video, whereas the warriors of this period saw their, their relationship of duty and obedience as a contractual one. And this passage right here sort of makes that very clear, because the reason why the, the monk Sagami doesn't believe that Ashikaga would betray him, because from his perspective, from the perspective of the Hojo clan, they believe that they have done right by him. That, you know, in his service to them, they have rewarded him handsomely by, you know, letting him marry a very prominent, you know, daughter in their family and generally like treating him well and treating him, treating him good. So the belief is that, you know, he's done his service, you know, the Ashikaga have done their service to us, but at the same time, we as, you know, the Lords have done our service to him. Therefore he won't betray us. I mean, as, as I've already pointed out, he, you know, he'll betray them, <laughs> but they don't believe that it will happen precisely because, again, because they don't have this later understanding of how sort of like the duty of loyalty is supposed to work. They have this sort of contractual understanding of how the duty of loyalty is meant to work. So at the end of the day, though, um, Takuji does betray <laughs> betray them. So he, he rides off to Owari province. Owari is sort of central Japan. It's, it's actually the Owari no Kuni is where not the city now of Nagoya is, which is why the Lord Nagoya is the one he betrays first. Um, so he rides out, and even as he's sort of making plans with the Lord Nagoya to sort of repel these, these imperial rebels who are trying to reassert themselves, he's making inroads with the imperial court to act on their behalf. And so Takauji betrays the Lord Nagoya by attacking him from the rear. Um, they're slaughtered and they're routed and all sorts of bad things happen. And as a result of this, there's this really, and if you get nothing else from this video, like if you focus on nothing else, I want you to read very closely this passage in 245. Because if you have any sorts of preconceptions about like what warrior culture is like and how they understood like their role as like dutiful servants to their lords, like this passage right here completely upends that. So let's take a look at page 245 in detail. In fact, I'll look at more of it than just that passage that I cited there. So let's start here at the very bottom of the page, 244. So this is a conversation between um, Nakagiri Judo and Nukashiro. So it says here near the bottom of the page, uh, Nakagiri Judo rode up above the road and called out to Nukashiro saying, is it not strange? 
Although a battle raged furiously in front from the hour of the dragon on, the attackers of the rear took their ease on the grass. And so this is how the betrayal works. It's like Ashikaga was supposed to reinforce Lord Nagoya and, and Buttress's forces, but he betrays him by essentially staying out of the battle for an extremely long period of time and puts the Lord Nagoya in a really difficult position. Uh, took their ease on the grass, feasting with wine for many hours. And when at last men came saying that Lord Nagoya was struck down, Lord Ashikaga spurred his horse toward the Tambo road. Assuredly, he devises a wicked thing. If it be thus, how far shall we follow him? Let us turn back here to bear tidings to the Lords of Rokuhara. So what Nakagiri is trying to convince his, his companion to do is to go back to this um, <coughs> district in Rokuhara, sorry, in Kyoto called the, the Rokuhara, which was a fortress that sort of served as the, the whole Joe base of power in the capital, because as I've noted, like the Kamakura Shogun is primarily based in the east. So he spoke, and Nukashiro answered him, saying, Well said, though I also marveled at these things in my heart, I thought perhaps he has devised a stratagem of some kind. But it is indeed impossible to be at ease. Now that we have turned aside from today's battle, Lord Ashikaga has become our enemy. Yet I think that I will shoot an arrow before I turn back. It would be cowardly simply to go away. What's interesting is that Nukashiro here expresses what we think of as sort of like the, the, the stereotypical attitude of a Japanese warrior. It's like, you know, he's, it's like, he's betrayed us, but I'm not going to go down without a fight. I'm going to go and I'm like, I'm going to take my bow and I'm going to shoot an arrow at them because I'm going you know, to die gloriously in battle. But the text goes on to say, he drew forth an arrow from the middle of his quiver arranged it along with the string, and made ready to gallop furiously in front of Lord Ashikaga's warriors. But Nakagiri restrained him, saying, Are your wits disordered? Do you seek to die a dog's death, that you would attack the mighty hosts with our 20 or 30 riders? And here's the, here's the money shot right here. It is better to do nothing than to become known to men by a foolish act. If we turn back safely preserving our lives for battles to come, we will always be remembered as men who understood the meaning of loyalty. So he spoke, and perhaps Nuka thought that it, that it ought to be so, for he indeed turned back his horse at Oe Mountain to return to Rokuhara with Nakagiri. And they ride back, and they inform the, the people, at the, the Hojo clan members at Rokuhara of what has happened. But think about this for a second. Let's go back to that passage. It is better to do nothing than to become known to men by a foolish act. If we turn back safely and save our lives for the time being, we will always be remembered as men who understood the meaning of loyalty. So here, loyalty is not understood as this sort of like ridiculous, like sort of, you know, you see this like in Japanese movies and you also see it in like Western movies that are set in or about Japan. Like, you know, the noble, like you see this, if you guys have seen The Last Samurai, this, this is sort of like the culminating scene in the movie where, you know, Tom Cruise's character witnesses um, Watanabe Ken's character, like Watanabe Ken rides out gloriously and dies for the, for the bravely for, for ult his ultimately, you know, futile cause. And, you know, and then the noble warrior's death is, I guess you could say an admonishment to the Meiji Emperor about what you know true honor means. But here, these warriors are saying <laughs> here, Nakagiri is actually saying exactly the opposite. Like, no, that's dumb. Don't do that. Because these are period, these are people who actually have to fight. These are people who actually live in a time of constant warfare. They're like, it doesn't do anybody any good if we go up, get ourselves killed now. It's far better for us to go back, report what has happened so that they can prepare. Like, th think about this. Like, if nobody goes back and warns them of Takuji's betrayal, then, you know, their own clan members will be caught off guard. It's far more sensible for them to go back and report what has happened <clears throat> and hopefully contribute in the fight ahead than it is to sort of do this foolish thing where they ride out and like, you know, challenge and sort of like try to, you know, attack them with just a handful of, of armed men. That's really kind of astonishing. Because again, this is what I was saying both in my previous video and, and I also reiterated it here, is that when you look at the details of the text from this particular time period, because, you know, even though this isn't contemporaneous with the Genko War, it was written shortly after it. And so the way the people of the Muramachi period understood their own sort of like culture as warriors is very different from the way it gets reinterpreted in sort of like modern Japanese literature and also in sort of Anglophone literature about Japan. 
And I think that's kind of remarkable and it's something to really sort of bear in mind as you go forward. Again, if you get nothing else from this text, this right here. And so, as I said, unlike the stereotype of these samurai dying bravely for a lost cause, Nakagiri actually emphasized how behaving sensibly is the key to doing one's duty. <laughs> being smart about it is far better than being sort of like foolishly brave. So the second major episode from the reading that I'm giving you guys is this moment when Takauji goes to the, the Hachiman Shrine. It's this one right here. So this is on page 240, no, it's a little further down. Oh, here it is, 250. <clears throat> so Takuji goes to the Hachiman Shrine in Shinomura, which is one, which is a more, well, I don't know if it's a super important Hachiman Shrine. So who is, before I get into this, I should probably talk a little bit about who Hachiman is. <clears throat> So Hachiman is sort of a weird syncretic like Buddhist slash Shinto deity. Like he's, he's both like a Shinto deity and a bodhisattva and a bosatsu as they say in Japanese. And he is sort of the, the patron saint, if you will, of like archery and warfare. He is a, he's a warrior, he's a warrior God and Hachiman is someone that like warriors of all castes like pray to and like give offerings to. But in addition to that, and this is a really important point for like talking about how the, the like the the chronicle frames itself. It was he's also a god who was really important to the Minamoto clan itself. And so when uh, Takauji makes his offering, he says, "Respectfully, I offer up this my prayer. Wondrous are the works of the great Bodhisattva Hachiman." the guardian of the tombs of my ancestors, and this is the important part, who will vouchsafe to raise the house of Minamoto once again. High in the heavens of the pure land, again, this is prior, this will be prior to the ascendancy of Zen Buddhism. High in the heavens of the pure land hangs the moon of his enlightened true being. Brightly, the glory of his harmonious God manifestation covers the 7,000 deities. So you can see the weird syncretism here because there are elements of this that are Shinto in nature and then there are elements of this that are Buddhist in nature. So the Buddhist elements are pretty clear, like the, the allusion to Pure Land Buddhism and the, um, the Western paradise. But the, the guardian of the tombs of my ancestors, um, as I talked way, way, way back um, in sort of like the pre-introduction of Buddhism to Japan, um, ancestor worship was a distinctly like native Japanese religious practice um, and in many ways was antithetical, antithetical, antithetical to the practice of Buddhism and sort of the Japanese have often tried to have, like find weird ways to work that out. So the ancestor wor worship is very Shinto in nature. Um, also Shinto in nature is sort of here brightly the glory of his harmonious God manifestation covers the 7,000 deities. And again, so this is allusion to the, like, you know, the, the hundreds and thousands, the, like the deities for everything that you see in like sort of animistic religions. And we also saw in the Kojiki. As regards the forming of affinities, he guards and instructs, yet he does not accept the worship of the unrighteous. As regards the dispensing of benevolence, he helps living beings, yet he abides with the upright alone. So he only protects the righteous. He only helps those who are morally upright. Great is his virtue that causes all the world to believe on him. On him? That's a weird expression. It shouldn't be in him. I don't know about this, Helen. So Helen Craig McCullough, who's the tra translator of this text, believe on him. It's a weird expression. Maybe it's a Britishism. She is British or was. Sorry, she's passed away. So what's interesting is that um, the, the text doesn't actually frame Takuji as a villain at all. In fact, in many ways, it frames him as this sort of like noble, I don't know, you can say champion of the cause of the Minamoto clan. Like, you know, the Minamoto will rise again by the power of Takuji. The Genji will be dominant once more and they'll smite the evil, to the evil Hojo and we will take over once again. And I don't say that just to like, to be kind of silly about it because um, on page 251, the text literally says, oh, I wish I would have been more specific in my notes about where this is. Oh, here it is. Now, since the years of Shokyu, 
Capriciously, the four seas have been ruled by men who were the ministers of the generations of my ancestors, the eastern descendants of the house of Tida. So this is kind of interesting. This is kind of weird here. So we have the reframing of this conflict as being in many ways like the, the conflict inherent in the Genpei War, that this is a conflict between the, the Minamoto and the Taida. So even though the, you know, the primary antagonists are the, the are going to be the, the Ashikaga, at this point at least, the Ashikaga clan and the Hojo clan, the Ashikaga clan are descended from the Minamoto and the Hojo clan, who, <clears throat> although they were allies of the Minamoto during the Genpei War, the Hojo clan is actually descended from the Taira. So that's what he means here. Wickedly, for nine generations have these walked in the ways of violence. So in many ways, in his prayer to Hachiman, he's trying to make the case that like the, the Hojo have become evil, more or less. Like they have gone against what is morally upright, the way they were supposed to be. And that I, Ashikaga Takuji, I have come to sort of set things right, to do right by, you know, the way things are supposed to be. They have sent away the emperor to the waves of the Western seas, which is kind of funny when you consider what Takuji does later on. They have afflicted the abbot of Tendai so that he abides in the clouds of the Southern mountains. Surely their iniquity passes the knowledge of man. Is it not a subject's duty to give up his life against those who are the court's bitter enemies, will not the justice of heaven strike down those who are the foremost foes of the gods? And so there's this sense that there are these, um, what, what he refers to as, what is it? Yeah, the Eastern descendants of the Taira. So that's literally the, the Hojo clan. <clears throat> and then he says later on, my trust is in the destiny of the house of Minamoto, wherein the generations of my ancestors have placed their faith. Wherefore, I await even such a project, prodigy as the gnawing of the golden rats. Let the God join my righteous battle. Brilliantly, let him slow for, show forth his wondrous power. When the virtuous wind strikes the grass, then for a thousand leagues round will the enemy be brought down. <laughs> so his prayer to Hachiman is not just an attempt to like... <clears throat> I guess you could say, like, get the get the gods on his side, so to speak. But it's framed in such a way as to sort of like relitigate the old, as like sort of like interclan conflict between the Minamoto and the Taira that goes all the way back to the late Heian period. And so it's like, you know, I Ashikaga Takauji, I am finally going to set right this conflict that isn't just, you know, this isn't just this recent conflict, not just the Genko War, but the conflict that goes all the way back to the Heian period. Like, I'm finally going to settle and I'm finally going to literally make things right. And so that doesn't sound like the text is actually... So strangely, his betrayal, his, his betrayal of the Hojo then is framed as a kind of restoration, really. <clears throat> I mean, in that particular moment, a restoration of imperial power, but more important than that, a restoration of his ancestors, of the Minamoto clan itself. And so then the last bit that I want to look at for today is the description of the Battle of Urokuhara. Now, Uruk the, the Battle of Urokuhara is an important one, but it's an interesting one in the text because it gives a really good, it's a really good example of like what a stereotypical like medieval Japanese battle looks like. Um, First, something to note about Urokuhara and the, and the fortress. So Urokuhara was a district in Kyoto, and as I've said before, was also Sanat, it was the, the center of power of the Hojo in the, in the imperial capital. So even though their primary base of power was in, in the east, in Kamakura, with the, with the shogunate, um, they had to maintain some, like, ba some smaller base of power to the west in the capital and sort of that base of power was at this small fortress, not really small, but this fortress known as the, the Rokuhara. Now we get a really, really fantastic example of <laughs> a Japanese battle and all of its gory in all of its wonderful goriness. <clears throat> so starting about here with the defenders at Uchino. So the defenders at Uchino were Suyama and Kono sent there with 20,000 valiant chiefs. 20,000. Okay, maybe. The imperial host could not gallop in easily, yet neither might the defenders gallop out easily. 
Wherefore, both of these abode in their places, passing the time with shooting arrows. So again, the battle, so that's stage one of the battle. Like, it wasn't easy to sort of, like, figure out how to, like, ride in and charge and kill people. <clears throat> so the battle begins with this exchange of arrows. But soon, from within the Imperial Army, there emerged a single rider. So now we're moving on to stage two. Wearing a lavender mantle over reddish-yellow armor, shading to white toward the skirt. He galloped in front of the enemy, naming his name with a mighty shouting, since I'm a person of no consequence. And this is important because normally you're supposed to say what your parentage is. It may be that no man of you will know my name. A retainer of Lord Ashikaga am I, and his name, <laughs> Shidarugoro Saimon no Joel. If there's a retainer of the lords of Rokuhara that will fight against me, let him gallop forth to behold the degree of my skill. So he spoke in the description of his sword and drew a sword three and a half feet long. By the way, this is, these guys are fighting with pretty big swords. <clears throat> so this is a sword that's um, a little over a meter in length, raising up in front of his helmet as a protection against arrows. And the two armies left off their fighting to gaze upon this man whose warlike spirit was as that of one worthy to stand against a thousand. Thereupon, an old warrior of around 50 years advanced slowly from the army of Rokuhara. So this is the, the Hojo clan's loyalists. Clad in black threaded armor and a helmet with five flaps, he rode a pale chestnut horse decked with blue tassels. He says, though I'm an idiot. <laughs> For many years, I've served as commissioner of the military government. And then, then these two guys, they ride out. Here it is. Here's the description of the, the description of the actual. So notice this. So the description of like the two men, like, so, the, you know, the one, you know, the one issuing his challenge and the other coming out and saying who he is. So we've got, you know, we got one. So half paragraph. So two paragraphs, three, four, five, five paragraphs that deal with sort of the lead up to the fight. And then we get one paragraph for the fight itself. As he spoke, these two galloped forward and with clashing armor sleeves grappled together furiously until they fell down. So they ride towards each other and then they wrestle. <laughs> they wrestled really on horseback. And actually wrestling was really important, a really important martial art at this time. Um, there's a, there's a story that's told about um, Yoritomo that at his 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 court he would after people after after his men would like drink and eat and have generally a fun time he would make them wrestle with each other because the whole idea was to sort of like they needed to keep up their sort of their their grappling skills because he knew that they were going to need them in battle and that this was sort of yoritomo's brilliance that in you know rewarding his warriors with a fine feast and and booze and so forth he also made sure that they stayed in tip-top shape grappled together furiously until they fell down being the stronger shidara got on top of saito and set about to cut off his head by the way the cutting of heads is important i'll talk about this in a second but saito nimble of limb thrust upward and stabbed shidara three times truly these were mighty men that even in death did not relax their gripping hands but pierced each other pierced one the other with their swords and laid themselves down on the same pillow and then we get another description and so there actually is a description of several of these duels and you know you can continue reading them but i want to focus on this one for a sec <clears throat> so this bit about cutting off his head the the cutting off his head part is not just like you know a gruesome description of what's going on in the battle it's actually kind of important for the um so this is this right here it's actually kind of important for the warrior himself to be able to prove to his lord what he has done. And in fact, the, the taking of heads is important because this was how actually how you got your reward. Is a, you know if you brought back a bunch of you know heads of your enemies and you presented them to your lord and put them on spikes or whatever, like this was essentially like a receipt. It, it demonstrated your your warriorly prowess and that you could use this as a way to say like you know and i have done service for you now you need to reward me so then the expectation was that by bringing these heads back to your lord you would receive this reward again it's um, an allusion to sort of the contractual nature of the relationship between between lord and vassal in this particular time period but another peculiar aspect of this battle and this goes back to this sort of thing that i was noting earlier about the way in which the whole war in the Taiheiki gets framed as a kind of like re-litigating the clash between the Minamoto and the Taira clans. And so actually, well, before I get into that, so here's a, here's a nice, this is a modern photograph, but of a warrior from this time period. And so we see the rather usual armor called um, Oyoroi, this 
brocade. It's it's made of a bunch of different things, but it's primarily like sewn leather plates. <clears throat> and then you see this weird like um, trapezoidal skirt <laughs> that they would have. And you notice how it doesn't actually cover much of the legs. And the reason for this is because this is primarily for fighting on horseback. And then they would have these like silk bloomers that they wear underneath. Um, his primary weapon here, his bow, his arrows in the back, and then his sidearm, his sword is right here. And this is very typical of a sword of this period, which in many ways kind of looks like a cavalry saber because that's what it was supposed to be. It was supposed to be, it basically was a cavalry saber. <laughs> And then here's the the I mean I had shown you guys this this earlier it's this it's this painting right here this is just a photograph of it it's this famous image of Takauji but on 255 um after the period of uh, I don't even really know how to describe it. so after the period of duels has is starting to wind down the text says now many of the imperial army being smitten they drew away, scattering toward Uchino, but thereupon the Genji sent forward fresh warriors to fight in their stead. Not the Ashikaga, not any of the other well-known clans from this period, the Genji. In other words, the forces fighting on behalf of the emperor are explicitly discussed in the same terms that we saw, like, you know, the two warring factions being discussed during the Genpei War and in the Tales of the Heika. <clears throat> so this is this here it is as clear as day like this is a relitigation of that in fact not only are the the imperial forces referred to as the genji if you go further down and many of the men of rokuhara being struck down so the, the rokuhara men being the men of the hojo clan and again not once has hojo or ashikaga been mentioned in this paragraph and in the previous paragraph and minamoto and taira came together in disorder attacking and fighting with a mighty raising of dust then further down, they hastened to draw away toward the Kamo River, but thereupon the Heike, and again, so that's the this other term for the Taira, sent forward fresh warriors in their stead who fought desperately not to lose that place. Eastward and westward in the first and second wards, the opposing sides shoved and pushed seven or eight times, giving way and coming back again. Nor was one army more brave than the other, since neither Minamoto nor Taira cherished life. But at last, the Heishi, and this is another term for the, the Heike or the Taira, drew away towards Urokuhara, beating down, beaten down by the greater numbers of the Genji. So once again, we have this whole conflict. In other words, as far as this text is concerned, unlike Chikafsa, who, like as I, as I said in my previous video, who understood this more as sort of like a conflict between the, the nobility and the warrior classes. Here, it's being framed in these older literary terms, not just literary terms, but also in sort of like the way the older historical chronicles understood it, as this sort of like conflict between the Minamoto and the Taira clans. This battle that, that sort of this struggle that goes all the way back to the Heian period, these two clans that are both sort of related to and descended from the emperor. And in many ways, the emperor kind of just like the whole imperial thing is all on the sideline at this point, because really it's about that epic clash between these two families. And even though we're now talking about Hojo and Ashikaga, in many ways they are proxies for the sort of Hojo Ashikaga, the Taira and the Minamoto. And so that's kind of the the point that I wanted to end with. One last little bit about sort of the the selection from the Taiheiki itself is that sort of the, the battle kind of ends chaotically and the text goes out of its way to make this point right here, nor was one army more brave than the other since neither in Minamoto no Taira church. So there's this idea that like both of these sides, like the text really does go out of its way not to judge anyone. From, the, from a fairly objective standpoint, let's, I mean, don't really need to keep sharing this. <clears throat> from a fairly objective standpoint, I mean, I don't know. I think it probably would be right to judge <laughs> um, Takauji for his betrayal, first of the Hojo and then later of the, the emperor. But the text really doesn't want to do that. It, it goes out of its way to sort of present what happens as it understands it. And rather than looking at it in moralistic terms, even though Takauji in his prayer to Hachiman like sees himself as the sort of like virtuous champion of, you know, the right and the good, 
the text wants to think of this in more literary terms. It wants to say like, you know, you, hey, hey, you, you, you've read the, the Tales of the Heike. This is just like that. This is, you know, another example of sort of this epic clash between these two powerful and prominent warrior families, none more or less virtuous than the other, but sort of constantly locked in combat in sort of this, this chaotic trial. And un, but very much unlike the Tales of the Hega, even though the text is alluding to that earlier literary text and its framing of this sort of like this societal tumult, this text doesn't have the sort of like, oh, everything's falling apart, everything's terrible, everything's going to hell. Like that is completely absent from this text. And in many ways, it just revels in the sort of the exploits of the warrior culture of this period. So bear that in mind in the future, when everyone tries to tell you about sort of like, you know, quote unquote, the way Japanese culture is and you sort of the way in which the samurai Samurai <laughs> are understood. Think back to this text and its its nuances and its complexities and the way in which, interestingly enough, and see this is something that really annoys me is that I mean again I'm getting up on my soapbox here so if you don't want to hear this you can just end the video now and go do whatever you want but I want to emphasize that sort of like the stereotype of Japanese culture that is presented to people is the more boring version. It is the one that just tries to tell you it's like, you know, X is Y. Like Japanese culture is this, and it's always been this, and it always will be this. But the accurate version of Japanese culture, historically understood, is the far more interesting one because it's the one with far more detail, far more nuance, far more interesting things to look at. It, you know, there are interesting clashes between different individuals. You have different perspectives. Like, you know, so I talked a little bit about Chikafsa's perspective on this period, and here we get a different perspective on the same period and the same events. Like all of these things point towards a very vibrant culture that has a lot of like complexity and a lot of nuance and a lot of interest in the way that sort of the way in which like, especially like the Japan splainy version of Japanese culture, like it just doesn't capture that and in many ways tries to completely eviscerate it. And I think that's a real shame. So, um, but that's all for now. Um, until next week, I want everybody, all of you to take care of yourselves, take care of each other, stay safe, especially in these trying times. Hopefully the pandemic will pass us by at some point and we'll all go back to living our lives somewhat normally. But until then, see you on the flip side.